Hello, everyone. This is Mario Dennings with the Keeping It Real Estate podcast and first edition new space with Amanda Douglas from Celebration Title. How are you, Amanda? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. I feel so honored the first episode and this new upgraded space. It makes me want to upgrade my my podcast game. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I think, our fourth variation of this. Um, so I started doing it in a, the old office in the old company. Um, and then we went to the studio in above my garage, which yes. is where you came. And uh, we kind of hit a wall on that one, you know, because if, if people knew me, it was fine to get people to come to it. But if people didn't know me, it was like, hey, come to my house, to this shady space above my garage. It, like people, I think, felt like I was going to murder them or something. So. Oh, no, it was a nice space. It was a nice space. Yeah, and then we, we started doing it in the other office, in a smaller office, and I honestly didn't ever feel it in there. You know, the space mm -hmm. was very cramped. It just kind of felt like everyone was tense, too close to yeah. each other, like a little space. It's it's nice. The, the vibe in here is very cool. I like it. If you guys haven't seen it, come check it out. It is amazing. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. You know, there was a lot of thought put into it and um, just wanted to wanted to make it feel like what I think things should feel like in my head. So, you know, I'm, I'm still a kid at heart and I try to channel that all day, every day in business and in my personal life. And so that's what this is like. It's like, what happens if you give a kid kind of like a, um, an open checkbook to build a workspace. And so they end up doing things like AstroTurf and graffiti in the walls and I stuff like it. that. So. I love it. And, uh, you've got the, uh, the boards here and the picnic tables, the outdoor space. It's amazing. Yeah. We, uh, we have some, uh, some playful stuff, yes. you know, because you know, the thing is as much as I think we want to pretend that real estate is like this very serious business that we are on all the time, there's a lot of downtime and a lot of the downtime I think happens during the day, you know, cause people are at work, they're, you know, right. they're doing their own thing. And sometimes, you know, if you're an agent and you have some downtime, well, you know, go play some cornhole or, you know, we're going to, we're actually waiting for a ping pong table as well. Oh, play, play some ping pong or, you know, take a bike and go down the trail, you know, so. Um, well, and it works too. Sometimes, you know, people need a break if it's super stressful and I know it is right now, right? So yeah. go, uh, go do a little ping pong game and come back to, yeah. to the fires. Yeah, exactly. It's, I think it's stressful, um, for a lot of people, but I think it's one of, I'm a firm believer that good markets are um, better at identifying weaknesses than yes. slow markets. 100%. And so um, we are, we've taken it as a, a as a learning, um, learning moment for sure. Mm -hmm. And optimizing our systems, uh, figuring out where we can um, cover up holes that we currently have. Um, and I, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy this market actually. I, it's, it's been okay for us. Yeah, same. We're doing the same. So just digging deep into operations, not just identifying opportunities, but looking at our problems too, right? Every every company has a problem and how can we pinpoint those holes? Because they, they show up when you start getting really busy. Yeah, it's it's interesting hearing you say that because you guys seem to have like growth that never ends with, yes. you know, it's like this crazy thing. Like So I was telling um, Zoe, who's helping us with the podcast, that I was listening to our previous podcast yesterday okay. just to make sure I wasn't repetitive because I don't remember what I said. I don't remember five it minutes ago. Either. So let alone, you know, a year ago, um, a year and a half ago, actually. And we were talking about your growth then. Mm -hmm. And that seems like the puny version of celebration title compared to today. Yeah, I know it's wild. How? I know it's so crazy. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, during the pandemic, it was something that, you know, I was, we were on a growth trajectory like crazy. And when that kind of hit, I was like, you know what, we're, we're not going to slow down, right? My number one priority was to make sure that I didn't lay off anyone. You know, I, I doubled down on personal development for myself, hired another coach, like really dug deep into myself as a leader and how I can make sure that every, cause I take it as a big responsibility, these people on, uh, you know, bringing them on my team, you know, their family and their families are family. And, um, I was, I, 
for us, it really showed up as an opportunity time to dig deep into our people, which just made us continue to explode. So it, w- it was a crazy time, um, but our growth hasn't slowed down, and it really is truly all about our culture and our people. Um, everything, everything we do, and I'm probably, I think I probably talked about this in the last podcast, but probably, uh, I don't know I don't that even, anyone's I listened I should, to that I one. I should have done my homework before I came and listened to it. No, 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 it. you're <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, but everything just is such an amazing growth in our team. And it's all based on referrals from in, internal, you know, we find some of our best talent from referrals and that just goes to show you the culture that's being created. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned in the other podcast, I'll ref- refresh your memory yeah. Uh, that that people talked to me about afterwards was what is that whole thing with Amanda saying that she she only hires off of personality <laughs> I'm like I don't know maybe it'll pay off maybe not and here we are a year and a half later it seems yes. like it's paying off because not only do you have an amazing team mm-hmm. but retention seems to be very yes. good with your team yes. which is sort of like the holy grail of real estate mm-hmm. and specifically title like title uh, folks, especially the sales reps in title, for a while we're switching uh, often, and that, right. that that seems to not be happening with your organization. No, and and you know what it is? It's so different. I actually was having this conversation with my underwriter the other day. When you think about the title industry, you think it's a very old and antiquated industry, but so are the people that have been in it. They've been in it for so long, um, you know. And they were even talking about during the pandemic, they're having to bring examiners out of retirement because they don't have people to staff it. And it's like closers and processors and, you know, funders, all of these positions aren't things that the younger generations are really thinking of. And that's something that I really saw. I'm like, we've got to bring young people in this industry. Cause if you look at most title companies, you know, there's one going out of business in Melbourne. I was just talking to yesterday. They just don't have people. Everyone in their organization is in their sixties. Mm. And because they haven't taken the time to, train people on being a processor, being a closer. And that's something that was really, I was really passionate about was getting really good people and I can train on that technical stuff. And plus when you dig into them, right. And you give them an opportunity they didn't know existed, they're going to stay with you a lot longer. Yeah. And that's one of the things that uh, we actually were talking about this just before you came that the title industry sort of that, that, Mm -hmm. that it's, uh, what you're talking about, that it's really hard to find younger generations wanting mm-hmm. to be processors, junior processors, closers. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Do you think that's a deficiency of the title company as a industry, generally speaking, with a culture? Or do you think those positions are just not attractive to the newer generation for whatever reason? I think it just has to do with the industry and the way they've always marketed, right? It's um, when you go out, every title company I've ever worked for, when they put an ad out, it's always for someone with experience. And most people with experience and title have, you know, been with their organizations for 10, 20 something years, they're ready to retire. Um, So it's really hard to find people with experience. And then plus, you know, the title industry itself doesn't look appealing when you look at it from the outside. Well, most people don't know it exists. They don't don't know it exists. And they're like, well, you know, what is this really? But when we make it more about an experience and more about customer service, then it's a lot more appealing because you can't be like, okay, you want to come in and read estoppels and lean searches and balance a CD. And they're like, no. Yeah. What does any of those words mean? Definitely (laughs) not. But do you want to shoot off cannons and, you know, say congratulations to new homeowners, like just the way you shift it. Um, that the technical part of it is so easy. Once you actually start teaching them, it's no different than like working at a bank, right. And taking applications or doing certain stuff like that. And I think our industry as a whole does a really poor job on trying to find new talent. And that's something that we've gone to colleges. We seek out, you know, we just had two girls that graduated UCF. They just joined our team. You know, they're staying on top of their friends. And it's funny because our underwriters call it the silver tsunami, right? There's all these older people coming out of the industry. So what's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. How are we going to find examiners? Because, you know, they haven't been teaching anyone for so long. So it really is all in the training. Um, And that's something we've built out big time. And you feel these are trainable positions. They're fairly trainable positions. This is not something that would take someone years to, you know, to have enough proficiency to be able to do it. Right. I mean, I think it's probably the same as an an agent, right? You kind of learn through every transaction as you go. It is trainable. 
Um, but it takes a lot longer. And I think that's why a lot of title companies are just not investing in the people and actually investing in career pathing and making sure that people want to be there forever. They go into a title company and they're, you know, we foster the teamwork environment. We've really broken up the system. You know, there's about six people that are involved in one file and that's just at a minimum. And that's simply because people take vacations, right? And they, they go out or, you know, they might be sick and we have a younger generation and a lot of girls getting pregnant mm -hmm. and, you know, switching that in and out. But um, a lot of times you'll go to a title company and you probably use somebody and you're like, that's my one person, which is fine. You can have one point of contact. But in general, they're like in this philosophy of like, these are my files. They still have their like printed out files. And they're like, nobody touches my files. Right. I'm the only person that can be in there. And there's never fostering teamwork, which again, never creates a culture, which again, is never going to bring on talent that's going to be there forever. Yeah. And it, it seems to me what you mentioned about the title company in Melbourne is curious because I've actually mm -hmm. recently heard about the same thing with the title company in North Lake County, where it's like the owner's retiring. So we're shutting down the business. Yeah. It's, it's, it's strange because that doesn't happen in other businesses. Right. Like a pizza shop doesn't just close down when the exactly. owner retires. Rarely, where either they right. sell the business or someone in the, the family comes and takes it over. Or, but there's been a succession plan. Sure. And oftentimes in the title companies, because I think they become sort of a byproduct of an attorney practice. Right. They, they just get like, kind like of off to the side. side. And yeah. It, and it's... It's wild because it's a very profitable industry, mm -hmm. right? So um, if they sold their business, you know, they would easily be able to find someone to take it over or the people that are still working there. But th the problem also is the people working there are about to retire too. So they're just like, okay, we're just going to shut our doors and, and move on. Yeah, it's, it, it's profitable and it's an industry within the real estate conglomerate that is very protected. Right. Um, just as in, you know, there isn't a Zillow coming in for the title company industry. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> yet. Um, you're still having this an intricate part of the transaction, this right. idea of like you have to have someone that brings all the parties together mm -hmm. and then goes and records things in a courthouse. Right. Um, that's still not, it's very hard to think about a replacement for that at this juncture. So it, right. it's, you would think that there would be a, a bigger effort to try to maintain those companies instead of just like exactly. shoving them, shelving them, you yeah. know, like. Well, and I think too, it has a lot to do with automations, right? Something else that in the title industry is not normal, right? Mm -hmm. To automate systems, automate processes, everything is very manual. You know, you're, everything is really open to errors with human errors, right? When you're having so many hands in the pot. So um, it's something else that we're working really hard on and building some proprietary systems to really automate the things that we can automate. And it's, it's crazy to be in an industry that is so far behind pretty much everyone else. And um, it's exciting too, at the same time. Yeah, I feel like within the last five years, even title has made a giant leap. Huge, yeah. To 2002. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't even say we're in the 2000s yet, but <laughs> maybe our marketing, <laughs> but everything else is still trying to pull out of our underwriter. Like, let us do this. Let us do this, you know, but um, it's, it's crazy that there's, um, but I think the biggest thing that most title companies in our industry as a whole really need to get a grasp on, on like a real grasp on is the fact that we're really a customer service industry. You know, like we don't, we produce a title commitment, but mine's not prettier than theirs. You know, it's the same thing. Um, but they, a lot of title companies don't look at it as customer service. And we've really been able to capture, you know, the buy side, right? Those buyers agents and the buyers are just as important as the people that sent us that deal. I did a little bit of a deep dive before this podcast mm -hmm. because I wanted to try to see if I could understand or I could figure out what are some things from a, a 50,000 foot view that I would find different with between the way you do things and the way other title companies in the area do things. And th there's something that really jumped out at me okay. and is you guys view the customer as the seller or the buyer or the buyer and the seller, like you treat them as your customer. Right. It sounds, if someone is not in real estate, they're like, well, they're the ones paying. Mm -hmm. So ev evidently they're the customer. But other title companies don't do that. Right. Other title companies view the agents who are not paying them anything right. 
as the customer. It's it's really strange. It's very strange. And that's something I identified from the very beginning. I always say we have we technically have two groups of clients, right? We have the agents who are going to refer us and send us business, but really our clients are the buyers and sellers. They're the ones that we need to shower and make feel special and give well, that agent, celebration experience. The agents are more cheerleader than client because oh, they're not sure. paying you. They're right. not paying anything. They're not to paying you. anything to us. And if we really take care of their clients, right, they're going to come back and use us again. You know, we do have sales reps and we bring a ton of value to the real estate agent. Um, but they're not our main focus and our number one focus at all times. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I might be overstating it. I'm not sure, but it just in, in a quick glance through social media, mm -hmm. I see everyone else praising their agents that work with them. Yeah. And my, this agent's awesome. And she always does such a good job or he does such a good job and high five with the agent and sharing yeah. the agent's listings. And then I see your social media and you're like, this is Mr. Buyer and Seller celebrating. This is Master Buyer and Seller number two of the day celebrating. The, yeah. You know, and I think I don't know if it's not something that people in the industry will quickly identify, um, but but in, in close examination, it's it's a big difference. It's a huge difference, and that's what I mean by you know other title companies shifting to this customer service mindset. The people that are calling in, everyone calling in as a customer or client. And, you know, whether it be a mortgage company, right, the lender on that side, we can get business from them in the future. It's just about providing the celebration experience to everyone across the board. Because, again, we're supposed to be that middle person. So why are we treating other people in the transaction better than the other ones? I'll give you a perfect example. I actually had a closing yesterday. And the title rep calls me on Friday, or emails me on Friday and says, would you rather close 9 a.m. or 10 a.m.? And I respond back and I, I'm like, I don't know, have you asked the buyer? Well, aren't you their agent? And I'm like, we can do rhetorical questions all day, all day but that's not gonna change the fact that the buyer is actually the one paying the closing fee is the one that should you should consult right. with when they wanna be there. I work for them. I'll be there at any time, any day. I'll make it happen. But it's their schedule that you need to, you know, to go to. But a lot of title companies won't even reach out to the buyer mm -hmm. or won't even reach out to the seller. They're like, hey, can you give me the seller information? Hey, can you give me the buyer information? And I'm like, I give you a phone number and I'll give you an email and right. you got to take it from there. These people are paying you for a service, not for me to be in, in between the line here. Right. Yeah. And, that, and there are some agents, you know, obviously we work at, as an extension of our agents too. So if they request us to always go through them for scheduling or whatever, we'll do that. But ultimately- Send it them really, to therapy. Yeah. They don't need that kind of control. But ultimately we, we love it. We just say, you know, if you trust us to handle this transaction, like we're going to speak directly to the buyer and seller because it is our responsibility to make sure we're collecting all this information. It takes a lot of pressure off of you. You don't want to be the middleman on giving email addresses and mortgage payoffs and scheduling closings between oh, 15 drives offices. Me crazy. I couldn't and do it. And um, so, yeah, it's just a matter of making it super convenient and easy for the real clients who are the buyers and sellers. I think, I think title companies that have their shit together are really the thing that will make agents life easier. Mm -hmm. Because if I, if there was a universal understanding that I'll give you the client's information, the second I give you or customer information, I know someone is going to tell me that they're not clients yes. or customers. Yes, um, like Disney, they're all guests. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that you give the title company the customer information and the mm -hmm. contract and they can run with it. There is very little use even for transaction coordinators at that right. point. I mean, yeah. if, if I don't have, this is going to upset <laughs> some transaction coordinators, I'm sure. <laughs> But in my experience, okay. I've had this conversation on a podcast before too. 80% so. of what yeah. they do is forward emails that were already going from point A to point B right. anyways. And so yeah. they're like a point between A and B. They're a weird letter of the alphabet in between them too that catches the email and sends it to B. Like, we, yeah. like that doesn't really need to happen so long as the agents are giving the information to the title companies and to the lender and the title company has open information with the agent and the lender, then, you know, everybody should know what to do. Like, there's no use for a transaction coordinator saying, have you ordered the survey, Amanda? 
if you already have a checklist that says we need to have a survey order by this day to be able to close by this day. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it happens. I think transaction coordinators are amazing for agents that are very difficult to get a hold of. You know, they're out on the road or in appointments <laughs> all the time. So it's nice. Yes. Appointments. <laughs> we'll call it that. <laughs> Um, so that it's great to have a transaction coordinator in that regard. So to kind of take all of that off their plate, but I think again, it just really goes back to systems, right? Like title companies, lenders, transaction coordinators, we don't have a great system together, uh, that can ultimately get a transaction to closing where everybody can see the status at all times. There is some stuff, but it's not good. It's not good. Yeah. Like Qualia, for example, which mm -hmm. a lot of title companies use Qualia. And I, I don't know if it's fair to call it the gold standard, but it's certainly the one that I've seen more title companies use. Mm -hmm. It can be a problem sometimes when there's multiple agents that have to access the transaction because right. then there's one login in the system for it. And then whether when you're in your phone, it doesn't remember the login all the time. So mm -hmm. if you didn't log in at one day, the next day you have to enter your information. So that's one of the 730 passwords that I have to remember. Yes. <laughs> and it's like, it, it can be case sensitive, you know, it's, it's case sensitive and it has to have one uppercase letter and then right. one weird symbol Then you know, it's like this. Yeah. Um, so when you're in a pinch, it's not, it's not an efficient system. Right. I understand its purpose and it works good, I think, in, in, collecting all correspondence of a transaction in one spot. And I, I see some positives on it, but there's certainly some big holes in right. it as well. Yeah, definitely. And, and it just goes to show you how, again, old and antiquated the systems that we, the tools that we actually have as title agents to be able to bring a better experience to our clients. Well, and it's kind of, I, I, I think in having this conversation, I'm kind of having the epiphany that it's equated to what you're talking about in hiring processors and, mm -hmm closers someone needs to put in the time to do the training to be able to bring Absolutely. this newer generation of professionals mm -hmm. when it comes to real estate agents brokerages need to get away from the idea of having this crutch which is a transaction coordinator so that the broker's phone is not ringing all day with questions so that's really the use of it right if you have a transaction coordinator you know they can sort of work as a firewall between the mm -hmm. broker and those agents instead of doing that if you just train agents to do it right and to have the communication skills that, that are required to do the job at a high level, then you, you avoid that step altogether. And that agent may be able to keep another $300, $350 in their pocket, which it's very valuable, I think, for anyone. But as commissions mm -hmm. come down, I think agents are really going to have to pay attention to this stuff. Oh, definitely. And the ones that tell me that they can do it, like, go talk to Ron the realtor, yeah. okay? this man does a bazillion dollars in real estate and I can ring his phone right this second and I promise you he'll pick up on the Pointer, first ring. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it can be done. It can be done. But yeah, we, I mean, we could have a whole podcast about our industry and education and training, right? Yeah. There's, there's so much that still needs to be done. I think you are doing a good job with it. Thank in, you. In specifically in being able to provide training by people who are qualified to give the training. Right. Meaning I don't understand my title rep or a, a home inspector teaching a class in how to win multiple offer situations. Mm -hmm. But what you're doing is you're bringing people who are winning multiple offer situations and you're asking, are you willing to say how you're getting that right. done? Yeah. Um, also different than the rest of the industry. Yes. Definitely. And I think, again, you know, in title, um, education has always normally been leaning on the underwriter to bring the education to the realtors and really just focusing on CE classes. And we all need those, but we show up because you need them, right? You're not showing up because you actually want to mm -hmm. learn the stuff that's involved. And it's just pinpointing what everybody wants to know, right? What's everyone struggling with right now, winning multiple offers. So let's bring some industry experts together that are doing that and winning multiple offers and just ask them how they're doing it. I think everyone's willing to share almost everyone, right? And they want the industry to be better as a whole. And it really just all goes back to education. I do agree that people are willing to share, but what people are not willing to do is have people share that they're not currently exchanging money with. Right. And that's another thing. Yes. Because you are d calling people into this masterminds to meet with them. I and mean, listen, it might be a fantastic strategy 
uh, a medium to long term strategy to be able to procure some business to have to build these relationships, you know, and that's probably what people in the industry um, would say if they view you as a competitor. Oh, she's just trying to hedge her future bets to try to get the business. Right. Or it simply could be that you're trying to provide better education because that's going to get yeah. more eyeballs regardless. Well, yeah. I mean, my number one thing is just be a person of value that brings value to others. And that's really what it is all about, right? Is, um, you know, I don't care if they use me for title or not. Um, they can provide education to people that do use us for title or maybe some buyers and sellers that are on my social media that are thinking about listing or thinking about buying. It's really just to, again, just bring value to people. I think there's so much out there on Google and people get scared and nervous and they start freaking out. So how can we just kind of bring those walls down a little bit more? Yeah, that's something that we talked about in the first podcast a little bit that the title industry was very secluded in that, like, you know, this company didn't talk to this company, didn't talk to this company, didn't talk to this company. Oh, and by the way, some oftentimes they're trashing each other. Oftentimes they're, you know, mm -hmm. I guess going after each other's agents, it's natural progression in the business. Right. But, but really the lack of a, um, title industry, I, I would say like independent title industry council. Right where people sit down once a quarter and just talk about things in the industry. Like yeah. that's still not happening. No, that didn't go anywhere after our last <laughs> podcast. <laughs> no one agreed to meet with me, unfortunately. But, um, you know, I, I wish we could. I really do. I wish we could get to that place where title companies were more sharing and open. And, you know, ultimately, you know, I see people copying our canons. I see people copying the marketing that we're doing. And in my eyes, it's just, you know, coming from abundance, right? Every buyer and seller deserves a celebration. So if you guys want to clean up confetti too, go for it. Yeah. yeah. Does that validate you? No, not at all. Not really at all. It just, it makes me happy that our industry is moving along towards really taking care of the customer. Yeah, I think so. I, I also hope that it's not a thing where people are oversimplifying what you guys are doing because yeah. it's not like... There, I, it always kind of irked me when there's mastermind panels, you know, and you have mm -hmm. four or five agents sharing. And so you would have, I have this very distinctive story. And uh, I went to a panel and Jenny Weimert was on the panel and Jenny was sharing how she runs her business. And um, someone asked what she paid her admins and she shared, which was probably my guess at the time, 15, 20% more than industry average. And then, Someone asked about her splits and she just told them what the splits were, which were, right. again, more significantly higher than industry average. And then they talked about accountability and they, you know, she talked about Mike would sit with the agents one on one um, to do this accountability stuff at the time. I don't know how they do it now. And then people will leave, you know, like the team leaders and the rainmakers would leave this mastermind and no one wanted to institute the pay to the admins no one wanted to give the better splits to the agents yeah. but everyone wanted that crazy accountability you know right. like oh i get to sit down with you and grill you every week like that sounds awesome and i'm like it doesn't work like that you right. can't just take one piece you can't just take the canon mm -hmm. and think that you're going to have and 300 and something in. percent growth right. year over year like right. it, it takes a little more than a canon it does it takes a lot more than that and like uh, jenny runs an incredible business you know, and it, she's on panels because she does, and she has amazing retention and has grown really quickly. Um, but I always tell people the same that probably Jenny says, right? Like the Canon's just something we do. Like the splits are just something they do. It's not yeah. really who they are. Right. So if somebody can take what you're doing, but they'll never be able to be who you are at the core, which is always going to go back to your people. Yeah. It, you got to give some to take some. And if, right. you, if you're really looking for that growth, the right thing to do is to call Amanda and be like, hey, I bought a bunch of cannons before I deploy them. What else should I be considering to make right. this a real experience like what you guys are doing? Right. Yeah. So we're constantly evolving and looking into different ways to uh, create a celebration experience, right? Because the experience is from the moment they call our office or send the contract all the way through closing, like the Canon's just that icing on the cake. You said um, earlier that you're also focusing on buyers. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah. So, I mean, we focus big on the buyer, obviously, even if the seller or the listing agent is our referral. Um, You know, it's funny, we get, we're starting to get a lot of buyer's agents, you know, that are specifically buyer's agents, you know, picking title because they want their buyers to have a great experience because if it's your first house and you go through a really crappy experience, um, it kind of is a reflection on the agent sometimes, even though they didn't pick it. Um, so these agents are really, even in multiple offer situations, picking title, right? Uh, because the sellers don't know. You know, it's just been the norm in our industry or the norm in our area that seller chooses title. There's no standard that says that's the way it should be. Yeah, it's one of the reasons we are very competitive in multiple offer situations. And he goes, here goes secret number one. Oh boy, here we go. I <laughs> love it. If you have the buyer, pick the title company, make your buyer pay the title insurance, explain to them what that looks like, and then articulate it to the listing agent that, hey, regardless of what this appraises at, we are lowering your seller's expense by a couple of thousand dollars or 3,000 or whatever the number is, which means they'll make more money regardless of what the appraisal says. Mm -hmm. Because offering more is oftentimes wishful thinking. Right decreasing the expenses is real money in the pocket today that you can yes. count with. Yes. And so that's one way that we are, um, we're, that's one of the things that we're using to win those multiple offer situations. If the listing agent understands what we're trying to do, if yeah. the listing agent is like, no, you got to use my title company, yeah. <laughs> you know, then it's a little bit of an uphill climb. So you got to read them a little bit. Yes. And I, and I think it is too, again, at educating them. So we're doing, we have done a couple of classes on teaching you how to explain, you know, how much the seller is actually going to save. Um, if you do pick the title company and um, actually sending them a net sheet from celebration title with your offer, you know, as yeah. a buyer and moving that seller fee to the other side. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's super important on that. And I think, um, you know, the buyers, we've had people actually come back to us to do a refinance because they remember celebration title. Like how many people on like your first house closing, do you remember who you even closed with? A lot of times you got to pull out your, you know, title policy and your deed, wherever you stuffed it. And you're like, oh, that's the name of it. You know, some random name, but a lot of people remember us. You know, I just went to the, um, like a restaurant the other night and I went to pay and it said, you know, my card says celebration title. She's like, Oh my gosh, I have my closing with you guys. It was so amazing. She's like, it was, uh, you know, we shot off the cannon. We have photos. Like we really loved it. It was a great experience. And I was like, Oh, who was your agent? And she was like, she couldn't even remember their name. <laughs> she couldn't remember their name. And I was like, wow, she remembers oh our company name, but couldn't even remember her agent's name. So it, was, it just goes to show you that just, making people feel something and feel good and digging into those emotions that that's all they really want. Yeah. I think you, you do a fantastic job at it and, and boy, that's, that's an interesting story yeah. because I think agents believe today they got that nailed. Right. Like if you just friend your customers on Facebook, you, you know, you yeah. got him for life yeah. and evidently that's a, it takes more, it takes effort. Yeah. It, it takes more effort. No, it does take effort. And I think, you know, agents, even during, you know, I've seen an amazing transition during the pandemic of them really stepping up and understanding that they are, you know, their marketing and really digging deeper into that. So I'm excited to see it continue that way. You, I know you had Erica in the company who was mm-hmm. your CMO yeah. uh, at one point mm-hmm. um, and she went on, um, she had um, the babies and, yeah. and so, um, do you have someone that's filling those shoes now or are yes. you? Yeah, yeah, we do. So, um, yeah, Erica went out on maternity leave and didn't come back, but we love and we miss her. And, yeah. you know, um, she was an incredible part of our company, but we're so fortunate to have um, our new uh, director of marketing is Laurel Norman, which mm-hmm. I know I think a lot of agents listening probably know who she is. So she was the event director at Aura okay. for, I believe, like six years. Um, so if you were ever on any of the Aura um, groups or panels or I forget what they're called, but, um, you know, you, I'm not a Nora member, no. so <laughs> <laughs> then you probably ran into her. So she's, she's run events for, you know, thousands and thousands of people and done Great. an incredible job. So she's come in and, and really taken us uh, to the next level. Yeah. It's, it's one of the things that you have also that's different. You have a dedicated, you've always had a dedicated marketing oh, person. Yeah. And so, also we have a whole marketing department. So, you know, our marketing department is six people right now. Wow. Yeah. What's so, the, how many people do you have in the company total now? Uh, we're at 74. 
do you rem- do you remember the number that it was no, last time? No, I was going to ask you. Because I asked you the same question okay. the first time. I w- it was probably in the 40s, right? 30s? 24. 24. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that goes to show you that. 24. Almost 400% growth that we've had in two years. So yeah, that's, that's crazy. incredible. I know. And how many offices do you have now? We have 14. 14 offices. Yes. Is it all in Florida or, or, or it's all in Florida. So, um, we have three in Volusia County now, which Volusia has grown tremendously for us. Um, we have one in Seminole County. We have five in Orange County. We are in Tampa, Naples and Fort Lauderdale now too. Oh, wow. Yeah. So South Florida is in in the docket. Yes. South Florida is in the docket. So we have an amazing rep down there. Uh, three girls in the office. We just opened that office on May 1st. So excited. Where, where are you going next? Um, my next targets are going to definitely be Melbourne, which we've been, you know, out there kind of looking at that market and, and interviewing some people in Jacksonville. Jacksonville. Yeah. That's a big market. It's a huge market. Yeah. And, um, uh, are are you working on something with uh are you ever planning on franchising your business or um you know basically taking the next step so that yeah you yeah, can so because your concept seems to be working so good right and it seems like it's ripe yeah. for that sort of thing where someone can take your concept and work it um yeah. so long as they have the same mindset and the um same culture and they understand how you got to where you got. Oh, absolutely. And um, yeah, definitely. So funny enough, I have been meeting with a franchise attorney. So you're, you're totally on that same path, you know, where we're going, but um, my crystal ball is working working great. And we didn't have this conversation before guys. So this is, he didn't have no no idea. Um, But I have actually been working on a concept to franchise. So, um, because I think people just want our brand. They want our experience. They want to understand how we train, how we do files, Um, everything that we do is completely different than any title company I've ever worked at. And, you know, every time I even explain it to somebody that's in another state or in another region, they're like, oh my God, we need celebration title here like tomorrow. Right. Cause it's just so different. And, um, so I've been working on a franchise model for a couple months now and, uh, plan to franchise into other states and Florida will always be my baby, but, I definitely don't want to manage a nationwide. Yeah, and, and yeah, and I mean, <laughs> it's not that I'm that that smart. It's just yeah. that it's pretty. It, it seems obvious to me. Seems right. like the next obvious thing because there's a point where things get too large for one person, right. and so you have uh, two choices really: either you gamble with the idea of you know watering down what you've built, right. or you go into the fry, uh, you know a, a, a pretty tidy franchise system. Yeah. And um, I did, I toyed with it for a while, you know, about six months on deciding which direction to go. Um, But I think this is going to be the better direction. And it's just going to be the biggest thing is, like you said, identifying the right people in the right markets and making sure it doesn't dilute the brand. What do you think uh, the future of real estate looks like? Oh my goodness. You have a giant, you have a giant sample size. Loaded question. Okay. So this current market that we are in mm-hmm. where there's a uh, lack of inventory. I don't, I actually don't know that I like that term very much Yeah, because there's more houses being sold than they were before. So right. there's plenty of inventory. They just there's happens just to be more, more buyers. buyers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's lack of inventory for the buyers. Um, you know, I, in my opinion, you know, and this is just opinion, just based on research. Uh, I think we'll probably see this type of market for another year. Um, I think it'll get a little bit easier for buyers because I do think that some buyers are getting frustrated. They were probably just looking to move because the interest rates were low and now they're kind of starting to back away. So um, in my opinion, I think we'll see it for like another year. We'll probably even out and um, after that. But, you know, Orlando is interesting because we get such different hot pockets coming in here. So whatever happens in Orlando is definitely going to be different than what happens anywhere else. But um, I see us being like this for about another year. Yeah, it's that's what I see too. Yeah. I, I, I don't, and, and I think a year is probably on the low end. Yeah. Um, it might be a little more than that. It's probably just, more like 2023. 20, I could probably see us having yeah, a little bit different Yeah, it just seems like a perfect market. storm, you know, like after COVID, people wanting to go, 
um, to places with better weather because they've been locked in their house forever mm -hmm. and they didn't want to endure another winter also right. locked in their house. And, um, and then, you know, Florida being a state that's thriving at the moment and it's been thriving all year and there's just so much and in international travel. Disney right. has actually been open for a long time mm -hmm. versus Disneyland, which just started to open right. at a diminished capacity. So yeah, and we have a crazy amount of international investors here, right? And they're they're just now starting to open these other countries for them to probably come and bring their money to Orlando. Yeah, it was the last stat that I looked. It was twenty eight percent more cash transactions that at this time in mm -hmm. 2019. So 2020, I don't look at any numbers from 2020 because right. it's like. It's so skewed with everything shut down and then all the mm -hmm. cancellations and then, you know, everything else. But but it, a lot of cash transactions taking yeah. place. We're seeing, we're seeing that a lot more now, too. And um, a lot of people from the Northeast, especially from New York, just cashing out whatever they had there and moving to Florida. Yeah, because it's still cheaper. Right. It's still cheaper. I <laughs> it's mean, still cheaper. And a you lot may have to fight for your house figuratively and literally, but yeah. Um, but you can get more for it. Um, we talked in the, we did a real estate panel okay. um, a couple of weeks ago where we talked about the multiple offer situation. And, and I posed this idea that I, I, I thought there was, there had to be more cancellations now than before. Mm -hmm. I, and you touched on it briefly, but yeah. it, it, it's, is that still something you're oh, yeah. seeing two weeks it, later? It's def definitely a thing. And I think, um, you know, it's interesting because it just yesterday I had, questions from agents about, oh, can they be sued for EMD that was never deposited? Like, this is the kind of thing that we're in now because, you know, they go that three-day window and maybe they found another house, right? And they're trying to put offers on everything. So, you know, our cancellations are normally in the high 20s, like lower than 30%. That's probably about average. Mm -hmm. um, right now we're in the high 30s on cancellations. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's... But, I mean, the, the contracts are coming right back, you know, three days later. Sure. Right, with the next person. But it's just like, I definitely am seeing that. And you can see, you know, you see it on social media when people post. They're like, you know, this took four four buyers to yeah. to get through. And I think that people start having cold feet. They start stop having buyers. Stop celebrating remorse. pendings, agents. Yes, yeah, stop celebrating pendings. Pendings uh, are not... <laughs> Yes. They don't mean any, I, I have never been able to come up with a good analogy of what celebrating a pending is, but it's celebrating for something very meaningless. Right. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. We had one yesterday that they actually uh, waived the inspection contingency cash offer, never deposited the money in the three days. Right. And it was like a $20,000 uh, EMD. They're like, can we be sued for that money? And I'm like, Yes, it's it's in the contract, you know, six like line sixteen A and B. Yeah, um, they can still see you if even if you don't deposit the money. Yeah, it's people think real estate contracts are something different. Mm -hmm. I don't understand because growing up my entire life, the word contract meant something very serious. Yes, but when it comes to real estate lately, it's like the word contract just means like meh. meh uh, yeah. We can uh, initial that later. You're yeah, it's fine. An, it, like, you're fine. It, it's, ju it's just a sort of an agreement. Right. Like, no, 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 no. It's a contract. It's a real legal commitment that you're right. signing to. Yeah. And I think there's there's so many loopholes and, you know, once you go to court and all of that good stuff, but who wants to go through all of that? Nobody. Yeah. So. And, and, and the escrow deposit one is the weirdest it's one. Crazy. Because I've personally never been on a escrow dispute situation, but you know, a lot of my colleagues have been, and it's never resolved the way that we, and we expect that it was going to be resolved. It was I've like, I've seen some wild ones. Oh, definitely. The seller gets to keep these. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. The, and it's like, it's always, it always goes however you don't expect it to right. go. Right, And it depends on, well, you know, I do like that they have to go to mediation first now. So just to see what will happen. Yeah. Um, cause that wasn't before, right. Our contracts, when was it? 2017 when it changed. Um, God, it's been a while now. But um, lifetime, I know lifetime. And uh, I think it's funny because we all think that it's going to go a certain way and they get all the way to court. And we it depends on what judge you get, really. Right. Because mm -hmm. sometimes they're just going to go with principle. Right. Like, why would you even drag right. this along and they just go completely against what it would have interpreted as? Yeah. Or, you know, just looking at the whole story is just mm -hmm. one of those that specifically when it's like 
seller is supposed to keep it because it was after the inspection mm-hmm. or whatever they were out of contingency and you know someone offered a cancellation and the other person didn't sign with like a split of escrow then it becomes like a the judge saying hey you had an opportunity to get this resolved and not right. drag it for six months and waste my time and the court's time right you know like but we we can't even really advise them on anything right. as an agent either you know i i definitely one thing i tell agents is like you cannot interpret the contract to uh, the buyer or seller. Uh, We can't interpret the contract to them either. Uh, They can seek counsel to do that. But if anything arises, you can just, you know, say in my experience, this is what's happened, but we're not a party to the contract. You know, it's it's an agreement between the buyer and seller. So they have to interpret. Amazing lesson. This is is your second lesson of the podcast. (laughs) We're not a party to the contract. Right. Yeah. Um, Because we can't interpret it. We just have to really relay the messages. Yeah, that's, you know, I think it's it's a virus in the industry. Right. It's this idea that agents can interpret contracts. is this idea that the agents can answer for their sellers mm-hmm. or their buyers. It's one of the craziest ones that I've seen lately right. because this one is very prevalent. That you'll call someone to show a house and they'll be like, it's your buyer cash? And I'll be like, no. Well, then don't waste your time. Oh, wow. I'm like... Okay. Is it your house? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Yes. And so I have to remind them, I'm like, are you authorized to negotiate in behalf of the seller? Right. Well, no, no. And I'm like, then just let me go look at the house. Right. You don't know how this is going to go. It's, I'm telling you, it's been out of the last that's five, crazy. zero times is the highest offer. Zero times is the one that you expect that's going right. to, it's, it's been crazy. People connect on some different levels. I literally just had one where there was multiple offers and the seller picked one because they had a dream about the number that they offered him. They're like, oh my gosh. They're like, we had a dream about it and we talked about it and we, 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 this is the number that we've been wanting for the house. That's the wildest one I've heard. Yeah, Yeah. we've been wanting this one number and this person happened to hit it right on the nose and everyone else higher than them. Right. Was like, I had to tell these people, no, you, you didn't get it. And they were like, were we the highest offer? And I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and why did they not go with it? Was it like cash? And I'm like, nope. They just had a dream about a number. Yeah, I know. It's it's crazy. So there, yeah, there's no rhyme or reason. And, you know, steering people away from even viewing something is, is crazy. I'm yeah, I just, I actually just saw an article from one of the um, real estate news uh, websites where there was a, there's a lawsuit being filed against a brokerage because the buyer's agent said to their buyer, the listing agent said they already had 10 offer to cash. We shouldn't waste our time. Oh, wow. So there's a whole lawsuit going on because the, of that. So they sue the broker and, you know, the agent and the brokerage, right. obviously, because this buyer's agent basically said to someone, don't go look at that house because you're not going to get it. Like you're negotiating. Mm-hmm. Now this, does, this is even worse because you're like three steps removed from the seller and you're right. negotiating on their behalf. And then there was some, some added nuance to where like the seller apparently knew the buyer, but they didn't know, like they didn't know that was each other's house, but they worked in the same place. Right. And they were, the seller was like, oh my God, if I knew you wrote an offer on my house, I would have totally sold it to you. Really? Oh, wow. And so now this buyer's out of a house right. because of the advice of their buyer's agent that not to go look at the house, not to write the offer. That's so crazy. You know, it's like the listing agent saying like, if it's not cash, don't, don't, don't bother. And I'm like, don't, don't do that. Right. That's a lawsuit. What, what do you see like in your opinion to get away from that? I know some people are like cutting off the, you know, you have to have an offer submitted by a certain time, like to cut that stuff off. Cause I knew, I do know that offers are flying in and it can get overwhelming, but that's the responsibility you're taking on. Well, I, I'm risk adverse. Um, so I try to err on the side of caution Mm -hmm. and I, I tell people, you know, we're going to be reviewing offers until the seller accepts one, accepts one. And uh, so right now we're scheduled to meet at this time. Right. And the listing agreement says that any offer received after consummation of a contract, it's not, doesn't have to be presented. So, um, so I know that's my cutoff time and we just, we had one that was, you know, this is. It it was very uncomfortable for us, but we had an offer come in, verbal acceptance, everything sent on DocuSign, seller was clicking on it, and another offer 
yeah. comes on my email. So I have to present that second offer to the seller and I have to go to the seller and say like, hey, we got this other offer. And I had to go to the first people and said, I am so sorry to have to have this conversation. Right. But an offer came in minutes before we had an executed contract. Yeah. And now we're in a multiple offer situation, mm-hmm. you know, and they, the first folks ended up being able to, um, to update their offer to still be able to get the house. But it's, mm-hmm. it's one of those that I, I tell people when I intend to present offers, but if something comes in, I have to present it. And it, you know, yeah. if it comes in after the fact, I'll just tell them we already have an executed contract. Right. Um, but it's, it's a, agents cannot be negotiating on behalf of the sellers. Right. And you know, and people call and they try to get an advantage and I don't fault agents for trying to get an advantage and asking what kind of offer do you have and how mm-hmm. much is it for and what's their financing and any contingencies. And I'm like, just send that in. I have to be fair to everyone. Right. Well, my buyer really wants the house. Well, that other person's buyer also really, really wants, wants the, the house. house. Yeah. So I, I have to kind of play it fair, but I think there is going to be, I think there might be a lot of repercussions mm-hmm. with this market to agents as more of this heartbreak happens. Yes. Because social media does something that's unprecedented, mm-hmm. which is it connects people that are 10 steps removed from each other. I have 20 something hundred people on my Facebook. I don't know 20 some hundred people personally. Right. right. But what I think ends up happening is, you know, you may have a coworker of a coworker, like that situation that I told you mm-hmm. about where you submit an offer and they're like, oh my God, if I knew it was you, right. I would have definitely accepted your offer. Well, your agent said not to even bother then go back to the agent and be like, what the heck? Yeah. Well, and social media gives you that, that weapon to, to find people. Cause I, Correct. I do know, you know, I've heard of a situation where buyers found a listing agent and, you know, online and, you know, messaging them on social media and, um, because they feel like their offer wasn't, you know, taken seriously according mm-hmm. to their buyer's agent. So, um, you know, it gives you that, that open weapon to anybody can be found on social media. Yeah. I mean, and I've had that. Mm -hmm. I've had people that their offer did not get accepted. Just um, be very confrontational and rude about the fact that their offer didn't get accepted. And like, you know, why did, why is my money not good enough? And I'm like, Hey, it's yeah. Listen, your money to me is as good as anyone's. I present the offers. The seller picks an offer. There's nothing that says the seller's going to pick the offer with the highest number that nets them the most. There's, right. some, there's a multitude of factors yeah. in there. And so, you know, I'm having now agents after the fact be like, hey, our offer was higher than that, what that property closed for. So what's the story? Yeah. And I'm like, the story is it was higher at one point and it didn't appraise. So it came down or whatever the case might mm-hmm. be. But there's so much nuance to there's it. There's so much to it. There's so many layers. And, you know, I, I know agents are frustrated because I see I see them post stuff like that on mastermind groups and all of that about being the highest offer. And oh, still not I'm tired of it. Man. There's yeah. so much bitching about yeah, offers. So much so bitching. Much, yeah. Like, just stop. Mm-hmm. You just do your job. If you, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Mm-hmm. You know, just present the right expectations to your customer that this is a marathon, not a sprint, and then do right. your very best job at being creative to get your offers accepted. I mean, yeah, it's, and I think it too, it's, um, you know, shifting their message, right. Of like this frustrated, you know, this is why we didn't win whatever. And looking for more solutions, you know, of how to actually find these people about a house, you know, but also, you know, I think, um, as real estate agents, you know, be more cognizant of posting, you know, however many offers on this house and however many offers on this house, like people are posting that like crazy and it is creating more of that anxiety and overwhelm and things that people don't need to feel if they need to actually have a house. We'll call that tip number three. Yes. (laughs) Hey agents, you want to stop having buyers call you to look for houses? Keep making the market look like it's impossible for a buyer to get a house. Right. Because it's not my impossible. Goodness. I know. My goodness. Yeah. I see 18 offers, blah, blah, blah. I offer accepted. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, how do you think people in your feed that are looking to become buyers are feeling about this specific post that you're making? This right. is not intelligent thinking. Yeah. So, and I think that, you know, just figuring out what your solution is, how you help your sellers, presenting your value, not you know, what the market is, is doing, you know what I mean? Right. Like, I mean, posting that you're getting 50 something offers on a house is not going to help you get more business. 
yeah, because only one is the one that you only need one, by the right. way. Yeah. Like, you know, it's funny because I just had a seller who was, who was like, oh man, we only got two offers. And I'm like, that's one yeah. more than we needed. Right. You know, we only need one. Yeah. You may, you may get another listing and then that seller's like, well, I expect to get 50 offers. Like you said, you got on the house down the street right. and you get one, you know? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, in talking about the market, I think one of the things that's going to happen with this market is that it, it's going to turn quickly. Mm -hmm. My experience since 2005, real estate change doesn't happen gradually. It's in, for the scale industry is that it happens very fast. You know, so when the market crashed originally, it was like I had a job one day and the next day I didn't have a job. It was like, that's how it was. Right. I had pendings and the next day everything canceled and I had nothing. And that's, um, I think this market, you know, eventually you're going to have a, a higher number of sellers that feel that selling their house. Now it's like winning the lottery and everybody's right. going to go on the market within the same week mm -hmm. and it's going to bring the inventory just enough and you're going to have a hard time finding buyers because guess what? Your buyers were turned off by the messaging that you had about this competitive market mm -hmm. and they went out and signed a lease for a year. They right. signed a lease for two years because they don't want to have to deal they with this. They don't want to have to deal with it, yeah. Um, so, you know, the messaging is very important. You know, stop talking about this as some... Um, some some like a crazy you know flea market situation where it's not like that right. it's not like that people are still getting houses you're still going to get offers accepted you mm -hmm. just got to be intelligent about it if if you are an agent you know use the tools at your disposal you know as a buyer pick the title company as a buyer find out what the seller's moving deadline looks like right. and, and cater to it um, there, there's a th thousand things that you can do to, to make offers stronger. Yeah. And I think too, is like the biggest thing that people hire agents for is just to create that sense of uh, security and that things are going to go a certain way and not to exasperate that overwhelm and that anxiety. My hair's on fire. Yeah. Ah. Like to create more of a, you know, dramatic thing. And, you know, I know if I sold my house, I, I wouldn't want 50 people coming through there. Right. So like, in my opinion, I'm like, I don't even like that. That doesn't even sound like something I want to do. Right. 100%. Right. No seller wants that. Right. You know, I look, by the way, that's also messaging that could be turning off sellers, right? right. If you're telling people that you, that you have 50 offers yeah. on it and you had 200 showings, that, that might- That sounds exhausting already. That might be seller. something like people are like, oh man, we were going to sell our house, but we definitely don't want to deal with that. Yeah. Um, so it's the, it's the messaging is, I think a lot of the problem with messaging when it comes to real estate is the messaging is crafted in rooms that are filled with people that don't sell real estate for a living. Right. And so they don't understand the emotions involved. They don't understand, you know, where that sell, how that seller's feeling. They haven't sold a house in 15 years. And so, you know, people just want to oftentimes hear themselves. They don't want to really analyze a situation and, and, and try to figure out what might be best. Right. And it's the same. We go back to the same thing, right? Like I said, in title, it's really everything is about emotion and feeling through this process. As much as we want to be technical and do everything else, like these people are buying and selling like one of their biggest assets they've ever had or maybe saved for, you know, years to get here. And so it's our job to make sure that we can control our own emotions and make it a lot easier and smoother for them. Keep your emotions in check. Yes. Answer your phone. Answer your phone. I, yeah, really. I mean, agents. And they, only go to trainings from people that are qualified, that are qualified to give to yeah. those trainings. Exactly. Examine your examiners. Yes. That's and one of the best quotes that I've heard in a long time. I, it was one of my friends who coincidentally is a sales trainer. And he said, examine the examiner. Yeah. Is that the, we, we grew up on this world where like, you know, whoever's educating you is like on this pedestal and you're not allowed to you know, ask questions about how they got into that pedestal. Right. Yeah. And after a while, it's just assumed that they really worked their way to get there. But oftentimes it was, it's not earned. Right. And so examine those people, examine the people that are telling you to do certain things. And if it doesn't make sense, ask someone else, you know, yeah. try to oh, dig deeper. I say that so much like our, so we have a word of the month every month. Last month was curiosity, right? And like curiosity can be a superpower just because we do something in our industry a certain way doesn't mean that there's some law that says we have to do it that way. Continue to ask deeper questions, right? Title was, has always been done a certain way until we challenged it and kept asking more questions of why is it done this way? 
why do we have to do it that way? Is there something that we can do different that's better, that's more innovative? And I think that people, you know, like technology obviously uh, gives us a little bit of a crutch. If we see somebody else doing something a certain way, we think we have to do that too. Instead of asking a little bit deeper questions, okay, what, who are my clients? Would they like that? And, you know, actually being curious with people that are being really successful in the industry and asking more questions of how they got there. I think that's going to be the biggest education piece for any of us and staying in that curiosity. It can be truly be your superpower. Well, if you look behind you, you have a picture of a child peeking behind a curtain with childlike curiosity. Yes. So that is precisely yes. um, my approach to the entire industry as well. Yeah. You have to peek behind the curtain. You have to be curious and you have to, look at things without all the um it's kind of like baseball there's non you know uh, non-written rules like mm -hmm. we, we can't have that you know you have to look at things from a fresh perspective and um curiosity is a good one so it's a good one I yeah think, and it just reminded me of uh, the infinite game if you've read that book so like i have uh, yeah you have to read that book it's all about you know this game this game of life we're playing there's no real win or lose you have to play the infinite game it doesn't have rules like a baseball game mm -hmm. and uh, you have to always be looking at the bigger picture and asking better questions and how do you get there because uh, ultimately there's no win or lose in real estate there's no win or lose in title right speaking of books have you finished 12 rules i have not i knew you were going to ask me that <laughs> um, but so far i do love it yeah. uh, so i'm on rule number three now uh, which is about picking your friends mm -hmm. that want to basically want to see you do better, which I think is, is an amazing, amazing thing. Yeah. So it's, um, I'll tell you a little bit cause he just released a sequel for that I book saw that, yeah. and, uh, the sequel is good. The first book is highly regarded as one of the best books of the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he had an original list of, I think, 40-something rules that he came up with after being a clinical psychologist and the head of psychology in Toronto University. I think he also taught at Harvard. Um, and then he kind of compressed that into 12 rules. And then the next book is kind of like reverse. is like how to bring... The first book is about bringing more order into your life if okay. your life is in chaos. The second book is how having too much order can be a problem and you oh, need to introduce okay. chaos on, on a measured, yeah. um, on measured basis, but it's, it's really good. I'm glad you're enjoying yeah, it. Yeah. I'm excited to finish it for sure. So it seems like such simple rules, but the way he breaks it down in such practical uh, situations is neat. I, I saw that the next chapter I think is about don't let your children uh, do anything that you would make dislike them. Dislike them. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a good one. Another one that for parents is, I think it's rule 11, which is um, don't distract your kids when they're in skateboards. Okay. <laughs> you know, like you don't break their thought process yes. when they're doing dangerous things. Just let them go through well, with yeah. emotions. And the, the rules are simple, mm -hmm. but there is a there is a purpose to the book, which I think it's it has infinite value, and I think mm -hmm. that's why it's been so successful. And is this eternal p chase that people have to happiness, as if it's like a destination that mm -hmm. you get to and you get welcomed, and you know you touch magic rings, and it's like, oh, you're part of the happy club now. Welcome, yeah. you know, you can stay here forever now. And it's um, he breaks it down simpler than that. It's you know, happiness, not a destination is a byproduct mm -hmm. of having meaning. Right. And so that's, that's, that's really what I live by is oh, uh, yeah. uh, having meaning and purpose. It's if the, the worst days of my life have always been the days when I felt like I didn't have meaning or purpose. Yes. And those definitely. were the darkest and the more meaning, the more things I do, the more involved I am with things, the mm -hmm. more difficult things I tackle and try to learn the, yeah. the, the more productive I am and the happier I am. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that, that's such an important, like our word of this month is freedom. So a lot of mm -hmm. this stuff is uh, going into play, but you know, everybody has a different definition of what freedom means to them. Right. And a lot of times we'll focus on material things or hitting a certain achievement as freedom. And normally if you focus on those things, let's, let's say I focus on money, you know, which is a big thing that a lot of people do. You'll never really like you see that as freedom but you'll never really have enough if that's what the one thing that you're focusing mm -hmm. on. Um, but when you talk about freedom to me, it's like, you know, living a life of joy, 
fulfillment, all of those things. And, um, you know, people talk about happiness, but it comes and goes, right? I can right. be super happy this morning and then have a low moment and be happy later in the afternoon. But like pure joy is really what you're seeking and more f- freedom, but your definition of freedom. Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree with that. Yeah. I think, you know, freedom is mischaracterized. It's a, yes. it's a word that is mischaracterized a lot also because it's politicized. It's, it's, you know, taken, Mm -hmm. it's one of those words that means a thing and it gets just stretched in so many different places. Um, but freedom to me is about thought too. You know, my, my, for me, freedom is thought. And, and it's funny because a lot of people perceive themselves as being very free and you are like, Hey, you want to go do this? Or you, would you, why don't you pursue that one thing? Like they will mm-hmm. be, you know, watching a pool game. Oh man, I wanted to be a professional pool player. I'm like, have you taken lessons? Right. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. Well, mm-hmm. then you're not as free as you thought you were. Right. Yeah. Or I always wanted to be a singer. Have, have you taken voice lessons? No. I, I, yeah. No. They have still have those limiting beliefs, you know, kind yeah. of holding them yeah, back. I'm, I'm 50. I can't do that now. And I'm like, yeah. no, that's not, you're not free then. You, mm-hmm. you got to do better than that. Yeah. So I I challenge people to define what their version of freedom is. And, you know, we did an exercise with the group. So I I do a ton of personal training with my team, which I think is also Mm -hmm. a big part of why we're able to really cultivate such a good culture, because I feel like if I pour into them, they're going to pour into the clients. And, uh, you know, my my fulfillment comes from seeing them succeed and, you know, as an owner. But uh, we did an exercise on just like closing your eyes and uh, just imagining, you know, a moment where you're experiencing like pure joy, like who's there, you know, how do you feel? Um, but don't focus on the things to like focus on the people and your emotions and how you're feeling at the moment. That can really help you define your version of freedom. Very good. Yeah. Amanda, thank you so much for coming again. Thanks for having me. Of course. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate you. Of course.